I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is March 8, 2022. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Okay, Chair Hansen is present. Vice Chair Wozlowick? Wozlowick, present. Lead Heinzman? Present. Representative Acomb? Present. Representative Ackland? Present. Representative Backer? Backer, present. Representative Becker Finn? Becker Finn, present. Representative Eklund? Present. Representative Fisher? Fisher, present. Representative Green? Present. Uh, Representative Igo, looks like he's just connecting. Uh, Representative Jordan? Jordan, present. Representative Keeler? Keeler, present. Representative Lee is excused. Representative Lippert? Lippert, present. Representative Lewick? Lewick, present. Representative Morrison? Morrison, present. Representative Nelson? Nelson, present. Representative Tice? Tice, present. All right. And Representative Igo? Igo, present. Perfect. Thank you. The quorum is present. Vice Chair Wozlick, would you uh, take the gavel? Yep, I will do that. Good luck with your bill. All right, let's see here. Representative Fisher, have you had a chance to look at the minutes from our uh, March 3rd meeting? Yes, Chair Wozlick, I've had a chance to look at the minutes from March 3rd, and I move the approval of the March 3rd minutes. Representative Fisher moves to the minutes for March 3rd, 2022. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Minutes are approved. First on the agenda today is House File 3787, Representative Kegel Bill. I will move that House File 3787 be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation, Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Um, I do see that Representative Kegel also has an author's amendment. Um, Representative Kegel, do you want to describe that amendment first and then we'll move it? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So the DE amendment, sorry, I need to pull it up. I believe it just gets the um, bill in the um, form we would like it to move forward in. All right, I will move the DE2 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author wants. All those in favor, in favor please say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. Representative Cagle, um, you have the floor to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, so this is a voter education bill. And so um, why am I bringing this bill forward now? This um, bill is really about the key advocates in the voting lakes and rivers community coming together to seek implementation of a mandatory voter education program in Minnesota. Um, as Minnesotans see record levels of participation on the water, it's more important than ever that we protect and maintain the safety of voters as well as the cleanliness and health of our aquatic ecosystems. Minnesota is one of the handful of states that doesn't have any voter um, education requirements for all voters. And every other recreational project in Minnesota, snowmobiles, ATVs, um, motorcycles, they all have education requirements and um, safety training for users. And I have my snowmobile stamp on my card. Um, and now I know that I'm going to have to be the second to the last letter because I can only do this with my left hand. So any of the sweaters out there know that. Um, so this is an opportunity to allow um, stakeholders to work together to establish a voting safety and education program. So it would be um, an education course with national recognition and offer reciprocity for users, a proven way to dramatically improve voter safety on the water opportunity to deliver key messages on best practices to protect our waters and reduce conflicts or lake rage as I like to call it um, among users of our lakes and rivers and it expands awareness of um, threats of aquatic invasive species and uh, puts additional responsibility on voters to prevent the spread which is pretty important to me right now we just got our first zebra mussel in our lake up north and so um, kind of a disappointing summer 
So what this bill does is establishes a national approved and certified voter education and safety course for all Minnesota voters older than uh, 12 years of age. The course must be available online. I know I did my uh, my snowmobile course online when they used to, or actually not online, they used to mail you CD-ROMs and you'd put it in your computer. Um, so that's when I got my, my um, snowmobile one. Um, so, but it would also, um, the watercraft operator permit would be issued um, and produced either electronically um, or on the individual's driver's license. And it would be phased in over five years requiring any voter operator born on or after January 1st of 1987 to um, complete the voter education. And it's um, phased in so that January 1st, 2024, you'd, it, you'd have to be born in 2003. Um, 2025 would be 1999, 2026, 95, and then 2027 it would be 87. So out-of-state voters are compliant as long as they meet the applicable requirements for their state of residency. Um, same with Canadians, as long as they have a Canadian pleasure craft operator card, it would be in compliance. And rentals will be required to provide a summary of Minnesota statutes regarding voting, and the renter would take a short state-approved exam. So with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Perfect. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Um, first on the list, we have Jill Sims from the National Marine Manufacturers Association. If you could introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Jill Sims with the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Uh, thank you to the chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to encourage you to support HF 3787. I represent the boat, engine, and marine accessory manufacturers, including many Minnesota brands that boaters know and love. We all know that Minnesotans love boating as Minnesota continually leads the way by ranking number two for boat registrations across the country with over 825,000 boats. However, where Minnesota is falling behind is in boater education and safety training. Every recreational product in Minnesota, such as ATVs, snowmobiles, off-highway motorcycles, require safety training except for boats. Of the top 10 boating states by registration, which are ranked Florida, Minnesota, Michigan, California, Wisconsin, Ohio, Texas, South Carolina, New York, and North Carolina, Minnesota is the only state that does not require boater education that extends beyond youth. In fact, Nearly 40 states have voter education requirements to keep all users safe on the water. As we continue to see significant growth in boating and fishing, we believe that it is our responsibility to look out for our community and establish safety standards and procedures so that everyone can enjoy the waters in a responsible manner for years to come. Today, we're really proud to work with a coalition of stakeholders, including the Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates, Mincola, law enforcement, and many other marine businesses to support this effort. This bill is an opportunity to implement a much needed and widely supported voter education program, which will ensure operators are safe on the water and the best steward of the resource. Thank you to Representative Cagle for bringing this bill forward. And committee members, we encourage you to support HF 3787 and thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Joe Schneider with Mincola. If you can introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Joe Schneider, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. We're a volunteer nonprofit organization that works to protect the public waters of Minnesota. Our organization is made up of coalitions of lake and river associations across the state, as well as many individual lake and river associations. In my role as president of Mincola, I'm here to encourage you to support House File 3787. Making Minnesota lakes and rivers safer for, ed, for recreation is very important to Mincola members and protecting the lakes from negative ecological, in, negative ecological impacts is another critical focus area for Mincola. The proposed watercraft operator's license coupled with mandatory education can be a big step forward in addressing both the safety and ecological impacts. Recently, we had the opportunity to partner with a few organizations who also believe that watercraft operators license will make a big difference in boating safety and environmental protections for public waters. Though we've not published, sorry, though we've not partnered before, we found that we could all agree on this important need and felt that being locked at the hip on this issue will help speed its passage. Today, you're hearing from some of those organizations, law enforcement and others on the importance of moving this legislation forward. 
The education component of this legislation pre presents an opportunity to help voters understand the rules of the road, or in this case, the rules of the water that will make boating safer for all, for swimmers to stand up paddleboarders, kayakers, canoers, sailors, anglers, tubers, skiers, wakeboarders, and surfers, along with people of all ages who enjoy the water from a dock or shore. By addressing aquatic invasive species in the education, we have an opportunity to help help voters understand the, the impacts that these invaders have done to our public waters, along with the best practices that voters should be using to help slow the spread of AIS. We're also looking to the education as an important step towards protecting the shorelines and lake beds from powerful waves and downward thrust of propellers. Mincola was actively involved to help the recently released wake research done by the uh, University of Minnesota's St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. We hope that this groundbreaking research will help guide the best practices for boating. And we look forward to helping fund the lab's phase two research on propeller thrust, as we believe it too will help define yet another important element of boating's best practices. In a recent letter from our multi-organization coalition to the governor, which we also copied to the environment committee chairs, we stress the need to have education consider all the users of our public waters, and as Mincola, we look forward to the opportunity to work with the DNR on this important education. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, we have Gabe Jabour from Tonka Bay Marina. You could introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony. My name is Chair, member of the committee. My name is Gabriel Jabour, and I have lived on Lake Minnetonka for the last 50 years. At the same time, I had the privilege to serve the city of Orno, the city I live in, which is 35% of Lake Minnetonka, almost in every volunteer and elected position, including its mayor. For the last many, many decades, it's been my goal and objective is to preserve our natural resources for future generation and try to really work hard to leave the resource better than I found it. And I knew right there and then it's a very large task and only could be established by doing partnership. And our history and partnership has been absolutely phenomenal, positive for the greater community in the state of Minnesota. We in the state are blessed to have public water. I've been in many states where there are private water. It's a lot easier to control private water than public water. And the last, I happen to own four marinas and a small on Minnetonka and a small boat manufacturer in Ohio. The last 10 years has extremely been intensive and hard on the water patrol that I help regularly and a, a substantially more aggressive in use and attitude and lack of ability to try to control the users. Many of the users are not the people who buy the boat, nor members of their family. The only way you could control the ability to continue the appropriate use of the leg is to have a way to educate them and a way to remove them in case they violate their right to use the leg. Last year, one of my friends had his dog dissected in half. Literally, the boat ran right through the dock. And Captain Shane Magnuson will tell you we had several deaths on the leg. Most of the time, I am involved in retrieval and assisting the water patrol. That's something I volunteer to do for the last 50 years. I really cannot urge you more that than anything possible is to see that we establish an operator permit in the state of Minnesota. In reality, we probably are the largest boat capital in, in the United States. If you take all the Minnesotans and remove their boats out of Florida, <laughs> we probably be one. We are extremely addicted to boating. A lot of our residents boat in many states. I cannot emphasize more to you that for public safety, for environmental concern, for ability of having total 
ability to use a leg by a variety of people and not be dominated by a, a small group of people, this operator permit will go a long, long way. And I really urge you and thank you, urge you to adopt the bill and thank you for giving me the chance to speak to you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Adam Block with the Minnesota DNR. If you could introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Adam Block. I am the State Voting Law Administrator for the DNR. In the 1990s, Minnesota was one of a handful of states that required our youth to obtain voter education if they chose to navigate our waterways. However, fast forward to today, and over half of the country now requires a population greater than their youth to obtain voter education. In the past two years, we have added over 16,000 motorized watercraft to our waterways. With boating activity surging in Minnesota, law enforcement has witnessed the challenges lakeshore owners, boaters, and particularly new boaters have been facing, including water use conflict, distracted impaired operation, just to name a few. Unfortunately, last year, we also saw 18 boating fatalities a number we have not exceeded since 2005. Half of our victims were under the age of 40. The DNR supports expanding Minnesota's voter education requirement. Providing this knowledge to a broader voting community will help all Minnesotans have a more safe and enjoyable day on the water. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, we have Shane Magnuson from the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. You can introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Shane Magnuson. I'm a captain at Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. I've been with the Sheriff's Office for over 22 years. I'm currently in charge of all uniform enforcement, including water patrol. I am here as a law enforcement officer who has not only been responsible for enforcement on the water, but has spent many of those years responding to boating tra tragic boating accidents and recovery operations. I'm here today to support the Minnesota Boaters Education Bill. I've seen what happens when boaters do not have basic boating knowledge. I've had to share with families that their loved one is gone, and we know some of these accidents were preventable. I believe boating education is the vehicle that will create safer and more enjoyable lakes and rivers. Water safety education program that focuses on lake, local issues and safety will make Minnesota waters safer and more enjoyable for everyone. There's required education for cars, snowmobiles, and ATVs. Boats are even less intuitive to operate. That fact becomes very evident in just a couple hours on a busy lake. On a daily basis, deputies and conservation officers see people who do not have basic boat operation knowledge. Boaters coming in too fast to a dock, not knowing right-of-way laws, or not even having so proper safety equipment are just a few examples. The most significant reason for boaters' education is to prevent fatalities. We must also consider the quality of time spent on our lakes and waters, and we share our waters with all user types. There are competing interests on the waters, toad sports versus paddle sports, fishing, and other activities. We have some groups wanting restrictions for other water users. Education should be the first step before we have to impose new restrictions. Teaching basic etiquette can help everyone enjoy their time on the water. For example, if we understand how to reduce waves when picking up a wakeboarder, or understand how, how speed and distance from paddle sports operators can reduce conflict, we can make the time on water more enjoyable for all. Most of my professional time on the water has been on Lake Minnetonka. This lake is very busy with many different user types. In 2021, a wakeboard association was formed by private citizens to provide boaters education. They reached over a thousand water enthusiasts. By the end of the summer, HDSO Water Patrol was receiving emails from homeowners on how much better wakeboarders had become regarding issues like noise and high wakes. This is a small sample of what effective education can do. This program provided a near immediate return that benefited all lake users. With this bill, you can give the DNR the ability to mandate a class which will improve the quality and safety of our lakes for everyone, all users. This bill will address many key issues. The date of 1987 will reach the date of people that we are most likely to deal with in an enforcement capacity. A phased in approach gives plenty of time for everyone to get licensed. Clarification of what a youth operator is by having one age for all watercraft and rental requirements to make sure all operators understand basic rules. I have never heard anyone make the argument that less education is better. We wanna give Minnesotans the best chance at making our water safe and enjoyable for all users. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you for your testimony. We have one more person on the list, Joel Carlson from the Community of Minnesota Resorts. You can introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul. And I'm here on behalf of the Community of Minnesota Resorts. And it is a resorter day on the hill. Uh, we've been meeting with many of you over the last uh, uh, day and uh, all day tomorrow to talk about issues important to resorting. Uh, and we appreciate Representative Cagle and the bill that she has uh, before you today. Uh, partly to make a record and partly to point out some areas that we think might need clarification uh, on the bill. That's why I'm testifying here today. Um, the, um, um, just so that you know, the resorting community supports voter safety, voter training and education. We think it's critical and, uh, and we certainly uh, support that education. I wanna just point out a couple things on the bill that I've shared with the author and with the DNR uh, that I think we can help clarify. And Madam Chair members, the first um, uh, point that we um, appreciate uh, and that has to do with the exempt operators. We, um, uh, we don't have to uh, um, verify or have training uh, for guests that are coming to Minnesota from out of state, uh, so long as they meet the requirements in their home jurisdiction, that's fine. We wanna make sure that resorters aren't put in the position of having to know what the law is in all um, um, uh, 49 other states and verify that we're going to take them at the word, at their word that they meet their requirements in their home state. And we think that's appropriate. We also know there's a distinction in the bill between Canadian residents, which would have to show an operator card versus just taking the word of a US resident we're not certain of what the reason for that distinction is. Uh, and it also doesn't address people from any other country. And we may have guests that come here that aren't Canadians uh, and aren't uh, um, US um, uh, residents and how do we handle those? That is on page um, uh, two of the bill lines 2.3. We also have um, uh, questions, uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, as it relates to the different types of boats that operators can operate. And this is on page three, um, uh, 3.11. And as we read uh, the language right now, if you're under 12, you cannot operate a boat, uh, or excuse me, a personal watercraft. If you're under 12, you could operate a boat with a, a horsepower of under 75 with an accompanying uh, operator. Uh, and you could not even operate a boat if you're under 12, even with an income of 75 horsepower, even with an accompanying operator. That's fine. The problem gets to be the 12 through 17 and the over 18 age uh, restrictions. And as we read it, unless it is somewhere in the law that we're not repealing, I think if you're over uh, 12, you can operate any, with a certificate, you can operate any uh, size horsepower motor that you want, and we need to make sure that we're clarifying that. And then if you're over 18, you can operate any boat uh, without an accompanying operator. And we just want to make that clear uh, in, uh, uh, in the record. What age groups are we talking about and what horsepowers? Um, uh, the last uh, point, Madam Chair, that I want to at least um, uh, try and get clarified for resort operators deals with the testing and information that would go on uh, when a boat rental is taking place. Um, uh, as, as we are required to do under the bill, we don't know what that uh, short test would be, um, but we wanna know, uh, you know, eventually, is that an electronic test? Is it paper? What are the record keeping requirements for a resort operator? And are they treated the same as every other boat rental? A lot of resorts, Ran a 12 foot, uh, 14 foot lung with a 15 horsepower motor. Uh, are they treated all the same from, uh, you know, every operator that may be uh, renting 28 foot boats with much larger motors? Those are our um, uh, main uh, concerns, Madam Chair and members. We absolutely support the training and safety. We just want to make sure that it works for everyone. Appreciate you um, uh, uh, taking time to hear our testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That is our last person on the list. So we will go to member questions at this time. I see Representative Backer has a question. Representative Backer. Yes, Madam Chair and, and members. So uh, I, I don't know if the author is the best one to explain this, but um, I'm, it's still fuzzy to me on how this is enforced, you know, um, compared to um, if someone's not at a resort, they're just going through a, uh, a 
a, you know, a public um, launch area to go in a boat? Um, you know, how, how is that enforced per se? Representative Cagle? Who is renting a boat? You know, I've, uh, I know I have not went through all the de the um, amendment for deleting and the changes there, but, you know, not, is this enforced through the DNR or is this enforced also through the Lake Association? Um, if someone could answer that, I'm a little unclear on that right now. Representative Backer, you did meet yourself halfway through your question, so I'll let Representative Cagle take that, and then if, if we missed anything, we can follow up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Becker. I'm assuming, and um, I'm sure the um, DNR can probably, and, and Sheriff could probably speak to better how it will be enforced, but I'm assuming it would be like, um, you know, when you're on the lake and the DNR stops you and asks if you've got all your life coats and, um, and you know, that you're not intoxicated, I would kind of assume it would be something similar to that. But um, I think the DNR would probably be best suited to answer that. Mr. Block, if you wanna take that question. Yeah, Madam Chair, committee members, um, that uh, is exactly right. You know, as we're out there on the lake, if we have a encounter with a boater for whatever that reason might be, and it's identified that the law would dictate they would need the certificate or training, then we would provide, uh, or we would ask for them to provide proof of that, just like uh, we would today if we run into that. Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. So um, how does this work, uh, maybe then the DNR, so we stop somebody on Lake Travers or Big Stone Lake, um, what, how does the penalty work Penalty for uh, yeah, excuse me, some um, bad cell set reception. So is is there a warning that happens, or because um, if you obviously are looking to do the enforcement of that, is how is that all? Um, you know, if you could run through that, because obviously we want to continue to encourage people to use the lakes. We want safety. I get that. I'm I'm not. A, against having safety, but just the clarification, um, out, you know, western part of Minnesota is a little different than the metro area on the um, amount of people on the lake. So could you run through that, please, there, um, Adam? Sure, Mark? Madam Chair, committee members. Um, so today, I don't believe in this bill there's any deviation from what we have uh, on the books today when it comes to the penalty for not having your certification. Um, obviously today, you know, the youth do need it as well. And each circumstance is up to the officer's discretion. Uh, we do like to promote education. So obviously redirecting them off the water if they don't have the training and encourage them to get the training. And if it's an individual that has been encountered numerous times and their adult uh, is allowing them to do that illegally, then we might have to take uh, different measures. But as far as I see, there is no deviation from what is on the books today regarding the criminal provisions pertaining to not having training. Representative Backer, do you have a final follow-up? We have two other members with hands up. No, that's fine. I have others, but no, I saw the two other members. So thank you, Chair. Okay. All right, next up, I see Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Could, could you refresh me again? Where is this bill headed or is it gonna be laid over? Uh, this bill is going to transportation finance and policy. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and one of the questions that I've got, and I, I don't see anything in here on a cost or exactly how uh, uh, this educational program is going to be paid for. One, how is it going to be paid for? And who specifically is going to be paid for it? Uh, there's sometimes a little tension within the agency and amongst the user groups as to who is uh, is going to fund uh, particularly the uh, conservation officer side. So I don't know, maybe the DNR could speak to that. That's probably one that uh, is in their wheelhouse. Uh, Mr. Block, and then Representative Cagle, if you have anything else to add. Sure, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, 
Yes, the uh, currently our vendor that provides the test that we have today costs the individual $25 for the online. The paper is free. I do have a statistic from 2020, uh, over 13,000 people became certified and only less than 150 opted for the free paper route. So um, most people are choosing to do the online course and the fees that are currently associated with processing these paper copies uh, are facilitated through our recreational boating safety grant through the federal uh, Coast Guard. We use part of their fees to make sure this training happens. Representative Cagle, did you have anything to add or is that a, okay, Representative Lewick. Oh yeah, well, it, it's saying, so uh, I guess uh, the, so it looks like, or at least is that a prediction that this would pretty much pay for itself? Um, I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in other words, if, if uh, and do we have to set a separate fee for that in statute? Because I know we got a whole nother part of the uh, uh, DNR statutes that deal with fee uh, stuff. That's obviously not in the bill. So I, I don't know if the author or again, uh, maybe, uh, uh, our friend from the DNR could speak to that. Mr. Block, I think you were nodding. I saw you nodding in regards to the question about whether this pays for itself, if you can address that piece and the other piece about fees, if you can. Sure, Madam Chair, Representative Lewick. Um, yes, the $25 is set by the vendor to ensure that that's capturing the costs to administer uh, the certifications. If somebody loses a certificate or they need another copy of it, they can contact Camp Ripley and we can help facilitate getting that other certificate certificate out to them, or if they take the paper version where they're mailing it in and we're gonna process that, the free version, then we will most certainly take care of that. Yeah. And, and so just a clarification, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, that uh, will we have to someplace in statute uh, set that fee or is that down at the vendor's level where they've got that discretion? Mr. Block, Representative Cagle, not sure who wants to take that one or if we need to phone mm, a friend. Madam Chair, Representative Lewick, yeah, I'm not sure if that's in statute. I don't recall seeing it. It might be at the vendor level, but I, I would have to follow up and get back to you on that one. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. That's, a, uh, that's just obviously one I would ask that the uh, author, uh, we, need to, we need to figure that out. Uh, we don't have to do anything, fine, but if we do, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we cover that. Uh, 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 otherwise, we might be not able to collect the $25. Anyway, thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Lewick. I see Representative Morrison up next. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Representative Cagle for bringing this long overdue piece of legislation forward. Um, I didn't realize what an outlier Minnesota is in this area. so. This is really exciting to see this moving forward. I'm proud to have just signed on as a co-author to the legislation. It's great to see um, this diverse coalition come together and agree. Um, you know, some some organizations that aren't always natural allies. This is this is the way it's supposed to work, and it's exciting also to see two of my constituents um, being members of that coalition. Um, my question is, and if I'm reading the legislation correctly, the commissioner of the DNR is the one who is tasked with creating the water safety course and the test. And I'm just wondering how wake boats will be handled in that, given that we sort of have evolving information about wake boats and their impact. Um, and maybe that's not answerable now, but I was hoping that maybe someone from DNR could take a stab at that. Thank you. Mr. Block? Yeah. Madam Chair, Representative Morrison, um, if this bill were to pass, uh, you are correct, we would be in the process of developing what that content would be, uh, what that would look like, and we would be providing input from various groups to determine what exactly that content should look like. So undecided at, at this time. Representative Morrison, did you have any follow up? I don't. Thank you, Mr. Black, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank All right, Chair. Um, we are running short on time here. Um, Representative Heinzman, if you want to go next. Yeah, Madam Chair. Uh, Officer Block, earlier in your testimony, you mentioned that we have 16,000 new boats in Minnesota. I'm wondering if that is a uh, number of boats sold or if that is a number of 
new registrations and we've just added an additional 16,000 to it. Uh, when you were speaking, I just for a second wondered if maybe there could be a clarification. That's kind of interesting to see that number getting so large if it is new registrations. Mr. Block. Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman. Yes, that is a new registrations. So that is an additional number. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had seen those numbers steady or maybe declining a thousand or so a year. And in the last two, we've done a complete reversal and those uh, putting us at a higher motorized registered number than we've seen in, in the history of Minnesota, from what I can tell. Madam Representative Chair. Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it does look like there's quite a lot going on in this area in Minnesota, obviously. Uh, got a lot of, uh, lot of new people out on the water, so I can, I can see there's some challenges there. Uh, I do want to mention to the bill author, the, uh, the DE looks significantly better, at least from my perspective, than the, than the bill that was posted. And I think that there's still some work to do here, but I'm probably going to be a yes vote today. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, Representative Backer, I see your hand is still up. Did you have an additional question? Or is your hand still up from before? I forgot to take it down. Sorry, I'll okay. take it down. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So, Representative Cagle, I'll give you the final word on, on this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I think this is something that um, is, is well overdue. Um, we need to make sure that we understand how we are affecting our lakes and the other people on the lakes. Um, and, you know, we're all out there having fun in the summer. We get a short period of time to be out there. Um, and I know I'm at the lake as much as I possibly can be. And so I just want to make sure that, um, you know, when when my kiddo and I are out on the pontoon or when we're to towing her behind on a, on a tube um, or taking a ride out on the jet ski, we have way too many sports. Um, but, you know, that we're all safe out there. And so that's just the main goal. And um, I really appreciate the time and support for this piece of legislation. I will renew my motion that House File 3787 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Vice Chair Wozowick. Wozowick, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Heinzman. Aye. Heinzman, aye. Representative Acom. Aye. Acom, aye. Representative Ackland. Ackland, aye. Ackland, aye. Representative Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Eckland. Aye. Eckland, aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Green. No. Green, no. Representative Igo. Igo, aye. Igo, aye. Representative Jordan. Jordan, aye. Jordan, aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee, aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert, aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, aye. Lewick, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Tice. Tice, aye. Tice, aye. Madam Chair, there are 18 ayes and one nay. And with that, the motion prevails and the bell is on its way to the next committee stop. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Hansen. Uh, I'll give him the gavel back. Thank you, Vice Chair Wozlick. Uh, next up is House File 3761, uh, Representative Becker Finn, Appropriating Water Authority Enforcement Modified. Representative Becker Finn, would you move that House File 3761 be recommended to be re referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. And then I also have an amendment. Um, if it's okay with you, we'll go right ahead to moving the A1 amendment. If you could explain the amendment briefly. Yep. Thank you, uh, Chair Hansen. The A1 amendment uh, adds a provision to allow uh, specifying the cumulative remedies uh, available under the bill. 
Representative Becker Finn moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Is there any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Say nay. The amendment is adopted. Representative Becker Finn, to your bill as amended. I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is a bill about protecting our water. Uh, water is the lifeblood of our planet. Um, we do not exist without it. And as an Ojibwe woman, I take my responsibility to protect it seriously. House File 3761 provides the Department of Natural Resources additional tools for enforcement and compliance in relation to water permits. A water appropriation permit is not a right, uh, nor is it carte blanche permission to a user to do whatever they want when it comes to their water use. A permit is a privilege and a permit, a permit is a contract. The state agrees to allow the use of the public natural resource and in return, the permit holder agrees to abide by what the permit specifically allows. Adding these enforcement tools will help prevent the violation of permits in the first place, which I would think we could all agree on should be the goal. Ultimately, violations, and especially repeated and egregious violations, are about the result of choices made by permit holders. Uh, I'm a parent, and I know that if I'm not clear ahead of time about what the expectations are for my kids' behavior, and if I'm not clear about what the consequences will be, it is less likely that I will end up with the behavior I want to see. But if I'm clear about the expectations and clear about what the consequences will be for failure to meet those expectations, you will lose screen time. Uh, there is a greater chance that things will go well for everyone. Uh, unfortunately, permits are sometimes seen as a formality and not the special privilege that they are. A permit is an agreement, and when that agreement is violated, permit holders should know and expect that there will be consequences and they will be held accountable. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I will go to my testifier from the DNR to further speak to the bill. Katie Smith with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Welcome, and if you could state your name and who you're with for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Katie Smith. I'm the Director of Ecological and Water Resources at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. The DNR plays an important role in ensuring sustainable water use through its water permit programs, information collection and analysis, education, technical assistance, and enforcement. Compliance with the state's water laws and permit programs is necessary to protect natural resources and ensure the best use of Minnesota's water resources. The permit programs provide for equity and fairness among water users, applies the best available information to inform permit decisions, and provides protection for water quantity, quality, and ecological benefits. Noncompliance with water laws, particularly in times of drought, threaten this sustainability. DNR's existing enforcement authorities are insufficient to address serious or repeat violations of state water laws. Changes to DNR's existing limited authorities would help DNR to ensure our water supply is protected and hold violators accountable using a variety of compliance tools. The DNR has the authority to issue administrative penalty orders or APOs with monetary penalties up to $20,000 for appropriating water without the necessary permit. However, the penalty amounts are specifically dictated in statute. The $20,000 limit is too low to deter violators and the penalties must be forgiven if the violations are corrected. The proposal would give DNR greater discretion for calculating penalties. It would increase the APO cap to $40,000 and require penalties to be paid for violations that are serious or repeat. The APO is a tool that allows for a limited penalty amount and can be only used for situations where corrective actions can be completed within 30 days. Other compliance tools, such as those used by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, would give DNR new authority to enter into schedules of compliance, stipulation agreements, and other actions to compel performance. These tools can be applied to a variety of situations, those that don't warrant a penalty, those needing prolonged corrective action timeframes to resolve, those that would benefit from negotiations with the permittee, and those so egregious that they warrant higher penalties. This proposal would give DNR the authority to investigate, require tests and information to be provided, and then use the appropriate tool to achieve compliance with water appropriation laws, work in public waters, and other laws governing waters of the state. The DNR also proposes that duty of candor language is enacted, prohibiting parties from knowingly providing false information or failing to provide information that the person knows is necessary for the DNR to make decisions to administer these water permit programs and laws. 
for the most serious violations, such as those that may harm or have harmed natural resources, repeated violations, or where economic benefit was gained, DNR is seeking authority to assess civil penalties of up to $10,000 per day of violation. These penalties would be assessed through tools such as a stipulation agreement that are not limited by a maximum penalty amount and provide for a negotiated settlement with the violator. The bill also allows for willful or negligent violations of these water programs to be referred by DNR to law enforcement agencies for investigation. The DNR feels these enhancements of authorities and tools would help ensure our water resources are protected and available for future generations of Minnesotans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next up, Craig Johnson, League of Minnesota Cities. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Craig Johnson with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to make some comments briefly with uh, some current concerns cities have with uh, House File 3761. Uh, I would uh, point out that as the uh, Department of Natural Resources initially sought administrative penalty authority, uh, which they got back in 2014, uh, the League was uh, fine with that, supported that. The League has supported the agency's work to develop groundwater water management areas and the authorities they get under that. And Minnesota cities spend millions of dollars every year right now to make sure that we are providing safe, affordable, reliable drinking water to businesses and residents and doing all of that under compliance with all the state's water appropriation laws, as well as health laws and pollution control laws that apply to drinking water. We are a little concerned that there is an attempt to so drastically increase penalty authorities on a situation where we are not aware of any case where a city has failed to correct a compliance within the designated time frame established by the DNR. And that isn't just a matter of a commissioner's decision that they could be using. This is applied by the courts. So we recently saw a situation where cities that were not even party to a lawsuit are expected to make sweeping changes to how they use their water in their communities because of a judge's ruling and the DNR's loss in a lawsuit related to that. With these changes, that court could then go on to specify the types of technology necessary, the infrastructure improvements that the court wants to see, could order the DNR to do that because they now have the authority to do that. And the only option given for municipalities under this statute is to decide how they're going to pay for it. And so, Mr. Chair, we respectfully appreciate the role that the department needs to play to protect our water resources in the state. We think it's very important, very essential, but we do not think that this bill is the right way to get it done. We think it is too broad for the purpose. And uh, we would be happy to continue to have discussions with the author, the chair, and the department uh, to talk about how to do that. We have not had the opportunity to do that prior to this hearing. Thank you very much. I am happy to stay on for questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Jake Wildman, Irrigators Association, Minnesota. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today as well. Uh, my name is Jake Wildman and I'm the president of the Irrigator Association of Minnesota. Uh, my family and I farm near Glenwood, Minnesota, uh, where we raise corn, soybean, peas, sweet corn, wheat, and canola. Um, we also incorporate cover crops um, on as many acres as possible every year. Um, about 75% of our crops are irrigated. Um, in regards to House File 3761, um, we are still reviewing it as an organization and the impact that it would have on, on our members. Uh, but I just wanted to point out a few areas of our concern. Um, first, in regards to Section 1, uh, the DNR uh, basically already has the authority to do a lot of things that are mentioned in this section. Um, for example, there have been numerous situations where in order for a grower to receive his or her permit, they must install monitoring wells, perform an aquifer test, and report those findings back to the DNR. Um, if they don't do this, it's most likely the permit will not be issued. Um, in section four um, in the bill, uh, there's some concern on the deletion of a minor, moderate, and severe language and the subsequent caps and the language being replaced with up to $40,000 penalty. Um, 
as a young farmer, um, that is a lot of that is a lot of money, um, a big part of the budget. Uh, if uh, if I ended up uh, having an issue, um, and finally, Mr. Chair, in my in my last concern is in Section Six, uh, Subdivision Two, which would allow for criminal prosecution of a possible violation of a permit. Um, and for multiple reasons, Mr. Chair, uh, that this is quite concerning for us um, as an organization. So, again, thank you for allowing me to testify and point out uh, my concerns. And as uh, the Irrigator Association will continue to analyze the legislation and its impact on its members. Thank you for your time. Representative Beckerfin, if you want to address those questions, and then uh, we'll take questions from uh, members too. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think one thing that's important to point out is Section 5, um, that if the violation has been corrected uh, and appropriate steps are being taken, that the penalty must be forgiven. So I think um, to sort of uh, reduce some of the, the concerns as far as, you know, the, the comment about, you know, 40, it's not like you'd have this penalty levied against you with no notice and you'd have no idea that it was coming and then it would definitely um, you would definitely have to pay it. it and it's also an up to forty thousand dollars so it wouldn't necessarily be that amount in every circumstance the reality is that we do have um some permit holders who where there are serious and egregious violations and right now we do not have the tools um, to get them to change their behavior and that that's part of the goal here but i do think it's important to point out that it's not even that the penalty may be forgiven it must be forgiven um if it's you know people are working permit holders are working with the dnr in good faith um to to correct the the problem so i think that's an important thing to note thank you mr chair questions from members representative heinzman thank you mr chair uh, Representative becker Fid, I'm looking at lines 5.23 through 6.7, and I'm going to focus in on 6.1. Um, you, you are an attorney, so this is something that you probably could address, but if I'm reading the bill correctly, it looks like the court can compel a municipality uh, to levy taxes. And I'm wondering, um, is that normal or is that a separations of, separation of powers issue there? Senator becker Finn. Um, have to read the section since I didn't know this was coming ahead of time. Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, next time I'll try to prepare my questions before and email them. I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I, I didn't want to just, uh, speak out of turn without actually reading, uh, what you were asking. Uh, Um, I don't think, uh, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for the question. Um, for, so first of all, we're sending this bill to the Judiciary Committee where uh, that type of question would definitely be the purview of um, that committee, which I happen to chair. Um, but I think that it's, uh, I mean, it's just one of the options that we're allowing the courts to do. Uh, you know, and if, if folks, I, I didn't get any amendments or nobody, actually not one person reached out to me about this bill, um, after it was filed or prior to this hearing, but, um, would be happy to work with folks. If there's concerns about that line specifically would be happy to clarify and work on some compromise language. Mr. Chair. Representative Heitzman. Yeah. Um, Thank you for thank you for the chance to for the question. I, I just I know this is an issue relative to your committee, Representative Becker Finn, but it did seem like since you were here and offering the bill today, it's something that we could discuss briefly. Uh, and it does to me look very much like a separation of, of powers issue. If you're allowing the court to levy taxes or special ass assessments, I think you got a problem there. And uh, hopefully that can be. Uh, worked out in the next committee. There's a number of other problems, but uh, I'm probably going to just ask a question on a different issue. Um, I thought it was odd, but for some reason, the language appears to limit actions 
to Ramsey District Court only. Why is that? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, that is where the DNR is officed. It's a venue provision, very common uh, in these types of things. Representative hmm. Heisman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Final question. Um, just want to confirm if the bill applies to state agencies, federal, federal government, for example. Um, I, I'm thinking there must be an example somewhere out there where a government agency or the federal government, for example, may be holding one of these permits. I could be wrong, but it just seems like that would be possible. And I'm assuming that this language would apply to them also, but just wanted to ask the question. Representative becker -Fan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my intention would be that this would apply to all permit holders. Uh, we expect uh, no matter what your title or where you come from, if you have a permit to use our natural, our public natural resource, that you would be held accountable in the same way. I'm not sure if the DNR specifically has an answer as to whether there are any federal agencies that have ever sought these permits. Any response from the DNR? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Committee members, I'm not aware if any federal entities have sought these permits, but I agree with um, Representative Becker Finn that it would be intended for anyone who applies for these permits, regardless of their um, public, private, federal, state status. Mr. Chair, Representative, Heinz, Representative Heinzman. Yeah, seeing some of the issues here, I, I'm going to be voting no today. Uh, but once again, thanks for the chance to offer the questions. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wasilek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank Representative Becker Finn for bringing this legislation forward. Um, first of all, to deal with some of the some of the egregious incidents that you mentioned, specifically Enbridge, um, that we saw big news about. And then it was sort of like, you owe pocket change on this and it does, isn't really effective. So um, I appreciate that to address that specific um, issue that we had with that company. But also um, Representative Fisher uh, probably probably heard this too, but um, Mr. Johnson was referring to, I'm pretty sure uh, what's happening in White Bear Lake right now, um, where the court has essentially ruled that the, the lake has to be kept at a certain level and um, the cities in the five mile radius around the lake have to cut water consumption in order to meet that level. And what that means in real life is that um, there would be no water usage except residential. So no businesses, no schools, no hospitals, none of that stuff. So um, in, in saying that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating this legislation because um, we have to ensure that that people have water, that they have drinking water, that they're able to to feed and bathe their families and themselves and, and that sort of thing, but also that our, our schools and our hospitals and our, our businesses, um, the things that make our communities a community have have the resources they need. And if, if um, I think this is a way to do that and a good way to do that and a way to say that um, the DNR and the state takes this issue seriously and wants to ensure that people have water uh, now and into the future. So just wanted to, to thank, uh, thank Representative Beckerman again for this and appreciate um, the efforts you've put into this. And I know that you're, um, you know, you, you take the feedback seriously and hopefully if there are some concerns with cities or other folks that we can work on something and get something done on this issue because it's a really important one. Thank you. Representative Beckerman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and just uh, appreciate, yes, I think um, in regards to, to the situation with White Bear Lake, obviously that's ongoing, um, an ongoing court case, so I know that the DNR can't really speak to that, but I, I will just say that um, what's rolling out right there right now um, with the courts is happening right now regardless of whether this bill moves forward or not. And so I think, I do think the concerns of local folks and communities obviously are valid and would just um, echo what uh, Representative Wazowick said that, you know, this is a way that we can protect water um, so that it is there for us to use for cities, for people, um, for people to be able to access that water because water, water is life. Um, and if people don't have access to that water, um, we're all in a lot of trouble. So I appreciate the comments from Representative Was Waslewick. Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. This question most likely would be for the DNR. Um, my question for the DNR is, how often do you run across a situation in which you're having um, 
into, you know, cities or maybe a, a individual or company that doesn't work with the DNR? Is it one out of thousand, one out of 10,000? How often do you have those type of challenges to need this type of um, change in law? DNR or to the author of the bill? Um, the I'll, I'll, take that I'll one pitch that one to DNR, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Backer, um, I, I couldn't give you a, a percentage, but I, I can say, you know, this past summer um, during times of drought, we had situations where um, our conservation officers issued cease and desist order, cease and desist orders for um, permittees or folks who didn't have permittee, who didn't have permits um, because they were appropriating either above or under a suspension. And they continued to um, to irrigate despite those cease and desist orders. So unfortunately, we do see some cases from time to time where um, we do need to take further action and don't have a tool to do so. Representative Backer. Yeah, I appreciate that. Because um, and if somehow you could get that data, that would be uh, very appreciated. Because um, I'm just looking, are we looking to um, change the law for a very small percentage? Because I do get a lot of questions out in my neck of the woods. I don't represent Glenwood, but I'm very, I represent part of Pope County and, and Stevens County is a, um, a significant irrigation. And I will get calls and say, hey, we can't pump water or we got this. And, and those folks, even though they're not um, uh, jumping up and down with joy, they do work with the DNR to find a, uh, win-win so solution. So if the DNR could um, forward that information um, or find that, that would be very appreciated. Thank you so much. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Becker, Je J uh, Representative Becker Finn for bringing this bill forward. Uh, this builds on the work that has happened over the years here in this committee. Uh, I know that when I first started, that there was very little that the DNR could do when people violated permits. As a matter of fact, there are news stories out there about people who are uh, who are irrigating their crops and refusing to get any permits at all. And it wasn't until we started putting the laws in place that we were able to address those instances. And it's great that you were able to see the loophole out there that people could still continue violating things and really not pay any significant penalty because that's what happened when the when the first changes were made back, I believe it was 2014, is that people said it was easier to pay a small penalty than it was to get a permit. And I think we have to do the same thing now, is it's important that the DNR is given the tools to make sure that people use our water sustainably in a sustainable way, because there are some bad actors out there that will continue to do the wrong thing until it becomes financially unaffordable for them. And while it seems drastic, I appreciate what you've done, particularly with having off ramps for those who are willing to do things in the right way. And I appreciate your commitment to doing continued good work on this bill. Thank you. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, you know, I think just, just to emphasize uh, that this, this change in the law would apply to every permit holder. That is the legislative intent. There's no sort of uh, special treatment here because uh, we need to protect water in every single part of our state. And uh, that, that is the goal. Um, if you're telling the truth, if you're working with the DNR in good faith, you're not going to pay anything extra and nothing's really going to change for you. So, uh, you know, if that's, if that's the one thing that comes away from this hearing is that the message loud and clear is that uh, we want folks to follow the permits. It's a contract. Um, you need folks need to hold up their end of the contract. And this is just a way to help induce them uh, to do so uh, into the future. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would, uh, it doesn't look like anyone else has a hand raised. So I will renew my motion uh, that House File 3761 as amended be referred to the Ju Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 3761 as amended be recommended to be re referred the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Hansen? Aye. Hansen votes aye. Vice Chair Wozlowick? Wozlowick, aye. Wozlowick votes aye. Representative Heinzman? No. Heinzman votes no. Representative Acomb? Aye. 
Acom votes aye. Representative Acklin. Acklin, no. Acklin votes no. Representative Backer. Representative Backer. Representative Becker. Backer, Finn. Uh, excuse me, Backer votes no. Backer votes no. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Becker Finn votes aye. Representative Eklund. Eklund, aye. Eklund votes aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher votes aye. Representative Green. No. Green votes no. Representative Igo. Igo votes no. Igo votes no. Representative Jordan. Aye. Jordan votes aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler votes aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick votes no. Lewick votes no. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, no. Nelson votes no. Representative Tice. Tice, no. Tice votes no. Mr. Chair, there are 11 ayes and eight nays. The motion prevails. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Vice Chair Waslick, will you take the gavel? Yep, I will take that. Um, next on the agenda, we have House File 3765. Um, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I would move that House File 3765 be laid over for possible inclusion. All right, Rep. Hansen, to your bill. Tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this bill extends the availability of a number of appropriations from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, uh, and it provides a one-year extension for appropriations from the trust fund expiring this June 30th. Um, this bill is the result of motions that were adopted at the December meeting of the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. Those were roll call votes with 17 to zero um, votes. Ms. Becca Nash from the LCCMR is here for questions. All right, um, Ms. Nash, do you have anything you wanted to add or are you just here to answer questions? Madam Chair, I'm just here to answer questions. Okay, um, do we have any questions from members? I feel like we need some Jeopardy music. No questions? Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, Representative Hansen, did you have any closing remarks? Yes, uh, Madam Chair and members, it would be my intent. Uh, this is, would um, be hopefully a vehicle for an LCCMR bill to pass this session. Uh, the LCCMR met uh, throughout 2021 and throughout that process, uh, it did not reach the statutory number of votes for making a recommendation. Uh, at the December meeting, it did pass these COVID-related extensions. So at a minimum, I would hope that we could pass these because they are recommendations, unanimous recommendations from the committee. I will be meeting uh, with uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and Ms. Nash uh, later this afternoon. Hopefully we can come uh, to some process of having a recommendation appear uh, through the LCCMR and voted on and passed so that we would have something that could pass appropriations from the Environmental Trust Fund uh, this session. But we don't have those yet. At the last meeting, there was a motion to reconsider um, the vote that had occurred earlier. So that reconsideration passed, but we have no recommendations at this time. So I would renew my motion that this be laid over. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3765 be laid over. The bill is laid over. Mr. Chair, did you have anything that you wanted to let us know about the week coming up ahead since we have some time here? Um, we have uh, the lands bill coming up um, and I believe both caucuses have been notified that if there are any lands bill uh, additions and amendments that uh, those should come forward. Uh, I think looking ahead to next Tuesday, uh, we would hope to have in our possession 
some of the CWD bills coming from Board of Animal Health. Uh, I think that uh, Representative Eklund will have a comprehensive proposal. So uh, Representative Heinzman, if you'd like to uh, work on that in the next uh, week, we, we like to have uh, some discussions about a CWD comprehensive package. Um, Mr. Strohmeyer, any further discussion on uh, 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 things coming up on Thursday? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. All right, so seeing nothing further, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>